Chris Litt is the producer and showrunner of The Late Show with Stephen Colbert, a show that has dominated the late night ratings for the past years and scored an impressive number of Emmy nominations, including this year where it competes for Best Variety Talk Series, among others. Uh, Chris, I'm Matt Noble here to ask you from Gold Derby, uh, what role do you think the show plays in today's uh, social and political climate? Um, we try to play the role of not changing things that are happening in the world, but perhaps changing how you feel about them. So we, uh, we take what's happening, Stephen and the writers distill it down to an understandable and entertaining uh, monologue that hopefully before you go to bed, you feel a little less anxious about what's happening. The show started, at least in terms of metrics like uh, ratings and uh, even Emmy nominations. The show wasn't nominated for Best Variety Talk Series for the first season. Um, when did things start to click? I think the show started to click before those metrics caught up. Mm -hmm. um, the show really clicked almost exactly four years ago when we decided to go live uh after the convention nights so we did two weeks of live shows which really coalesced the production team and the writing team um uh, around fixing all processes that weren't working and creating a sense of urgency in the writing and how quickly things happened and it cut down on the amount of time it took to take the show it allowed Stephen and the writers to focus more on, you know, the comedy and the message and the monologue. So that was really when things started to click. And then that allowed us to be ready to receive something like a Trump presidency where we had we had to already be at our top of our game. Um, so uh, that I think, you know, from a from a production standpoint, uh, it clicked around the conventions four years ago. With the live shows, but this might apply to other shows that you put together as well, um, how do the writers and Stephen react to the late breaking news of the day? Well, the live shows, we set up the, the writing room and what I guess would be called the rewrite room in a completely different way. Um, it's even in a different location. And it's I can only describe it as an art form. I, I, like, I'm not a writer, so I... I have the easiest job in the building on live show nights, which is just to kind of sit around and watch and be worried. But um, you know, what these these writers watch what's happening on television and then write jokes. And then in the next room, Stephen and Tom Purcell and a, a couple of other writers are in there distilling down what they have written, and it's it's fantastic. Uh, and then Stephen walks on stage and delivers this monologue without having rehearsed it. And in some cases without having seen the footage that we're reacting to. So it's, it, I will humbly say, I don't know another show that uh, on such a consistent basis can pull off a monologue that is absolutely written from in whole cloth uh, an hour before we're on show, on the air. Well, uh, Chris, do you, can, do, you have, do you have any memories or any moments that stick out of where Stephen just responded to something and was on point, something that he wasn't particularly prepared for? Well, obviously, <laughs> night. Um, yes. <laughs> not prepared for that. And that, you know, Stephen's talking about that was sort of a seminal moment for the show where he really, uh, we, we stopped doing the prepared material and he really became this raw, uh, person that the audience could relate to. Uh, a lot of a lot of people in that position. When you strip away everything, uh, you the audience might not like what they see. But it's, luckily, Stephen is a genuine person, and he was really started the relationship with the audience that night. Um, but you have to. Uh, it's not only the live shows. It's not only can you make the jokes. But our monologues tend to have a theme or a beginning, middle, and end. And what's amazing is to be able to look at what happens in a debate and then kind of distill down what the takeaway is as quickly as he does. Um, you know, it, it's like uh, you, you not only have to do the jokes, but you have to 
synthesize for the audience because the audience knows that it's live and they appreciate that it's live, but we still, we have a, I think a part of our mission is to not only do the jokes, but to make those jokes mean something. And to do that quickly when you don't have the whole day to digest it, uh, I think we do that in a, a pretty a pretty good job of that with the live shows. Mm. Now, uh, you came on to the show from, um, you have more of a background in uh, news and be, yeah, being in newsrooms and then you want a few, you want a few recasting Emmys and things. Um, what was it like for you transitioning to a comedy variety show? Um, completely uh, frightening um, because, you know, when you go into a new situation, if you read the books about leadership, you're supposed to go in humble and say, oh, explain to me why that is and how do we do it this way? And you're kind of full of shit. But um, <laughs> for me, oh, my God, I had no idea how, any, you know, how they get a show like this on the air. So um, it was really interesting to learn from uh, the team that was here that had had so much success over at Comedy Central and then take that skill and put help put people in the right lanes to do what they do and to remove obstacles. So for me, um, it was really exciting and completely frightening at the same time. But I think that's why it worked, is that what the show needed was uh, someone who could come in and, and ask questions that people who have been in it their whole career maybe weren't asking. So it was a nice fit at the time. And now it's just like, I, I'm so glad I didn't know how much fun these jobs can be or else I would have never, you know, done news at all. <laughs> Did, uh, what's the biggest thing you've learned about comedy? Well, the biggest learning curve I've had from a creative standpoint is at new, in news, something happens and you get it on television. You know, there's a who, what, where, when, how, why, get it on TV. Here, something happens. And as you were saying, like something late in the day and you have to blow up the show. But if the jokes aren't there, you don't do it. And that's very hard for me is like, well, no, this is a really big story. It's really important. It's late breaking. And they're like, yeah, but the jokes aren't there. It's not funny. You know, we don't have a way into it that works on a comedy show. And that to me has been the biggest uh, takeaway, the biggest learning curve of not only does it have to be relevant and what people are talking about, but we have to be able to make jokes about it. Mm. But yeah, like in news, you often lead with uh, what's most uh, important or unusual. And I... We have people that work in the building that came from news. You know, mm. we, we, we have actually set up the staffing to service um, the creative needs of the show in a way, almost like a news um, So I, I'm really, uh, I, we've done, I don't know, over 25, I don't know, how many live shows have we done? 23, 24. Two, you know, two dozen live shows. I walk out of those every night going, I can't believe we just did that. Um, but it's, it's a whole machinery that's been set up with some really, really good people. Yeah. Uh, what do you think the most special thing is about Stephen Colbert? That I can answer that immediately is that he, for whatever place the country is in, he has that gear. If, if we need to be serious, he can be serious. If he need to be goofy and sing and dance, he can do that. He really has a gear that can fit whatever mode the country is in at the time. And I think that's going to serve us in the long run. Um, it's really going to serve to keep the show successful in that if suddenly no one wants to talk politics, if suddenly the, the country is not talking about politics, he will be suited to do that. He can do silly. He can do serious um, because he's uh, such an intelligent person and such a great performer. And I think that that's what ultimately um, will be this. The show is not finding success because of Trump. It is finding success in a Trump world. But I think if this became a other, you know, Elizabeth Horn world or something like that, we would, we would still be able to uh, rise to the occasion. Yeah, I guess it's not just finding the right it's not just being able to go into all those gears, but it's knowing when to find the right one that sort of is needed uh, yeah. as well. Um, what was the most surprising thing about Stephen Colbert from working with him? Uh, that he is as close to the person on TV as just about any talent I've worked with. 
Uh, he's a, he's a, what, what you see is what you get, particularly in the interviews where he's not doing material, but that is who he is. If, um, if he was having dinner with that guest, it wouldn't be very different. So he's, yeah. uh, he, he's a, he's a very authentic performer. And I think, um, the success you're seeing of different people in this moment are the ones that are most authentic people that are fake. Uh, and I'm not talking in the late night space. I'm just saying in general, people that are putting on a, a front, the American public has a really good nose for that right now. And I, I think it'll be interesting to see what the conventions do because by definition, these political conventions are fake infomercials. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's going to fly. Um, and, um, one of the, one of the things that, that Stephen has really tapped into is being as authentic as possible on TV. Mm. Uh, I once, uh, I heard Stephen talking once about how, uh, these shows that you work on can be a real grind just getting them out because there's so much stuff that needs to be done and you need to find the joy. Uh, in that grind or it'll just churn you up like a machine. Um, Chris, where do you and the team find joy on The Late Show? We have this unbelievable thing every night, which is a live audience, um, 400 people in the theater that enjoy what we're doing. It's this immediate feedback loop that gives, that gives joy. Um, and I think you can see in your... You know, it, Anyone that works on this show, whether you are a PA or a writer, um, you go out into the world and people tell you how much the show means to them and how it's helping them uh, fall asleep at night uh, with a smile on their face. And that gives, I know, I just speaking for me personally, that gives me joy. The fact that <laughs> what we're doing every day is, is giving people happiness um, or take a little the edge off. It's like, wow, that's... That's as great of a feeling as I had in news when uh, you, you knew that you were helping to inform the electorate. You know, I'm not suggesting we're that important, but it's still, it's certainly as satisfying. And that, that gives, being able to turn scary times into laughter uh, is a tremendous sense of joy for the building. Mm, and I, I was in that audience in uh, a show I think you did in late December last year. Yeah, fun. Yeah, it was great. No, it was really good. I think it was the. So I think it was the last one before you went on break. Oh, then we were all punch drunk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Very good. Um, what? Uh, you, uh, what what and what is it like? Because um, I remember my first time it was uh, on the old uh, show, going into the Ed Sullivan Theatre for the first time, and just with that history in the building, and just having watched it from my living like room uh, every you know so many nights uh, before going to bed, uh, it was quite a surreal feeling. What's it like for you going to work there every day? It's it's amazing. Um, you know, when you look up at the balcony in this theater, which has just been beautifully renovated, you, you look up and, and you see the, the, the railing mm. that was screaming Beatle fans uh, in the iconic Ed Sullivan footage. Um, you know, those railings are still there. And it's almost like when you go to Fenway Park and you can imagine what it was like to go to a baseball game 100 years ago. And, mm. and in that theater, with that history, and it's, you know, I'm not, I'm not being corny when you're like, you feel this sense of responsibility just from a, from a standpoint of culture that, that, that the, some of the things that happened in that building. And, you know, we taped an interview with Paul McCartney that's going to air in September. And even he, who's just been everywhere and done everything, um, he got a sense of, wow, you know, what it's like to be back in that building. And even... Uh, I don't think he had been back since the renovation where it really does look like what it looked like when uh, Ed Sullivan was here. And it's, it's, uh, it's pretty incredible. And there's an elevator. The freight elevator is essentially, you know, it's still the old kind that's operated by a, a, an operator. And I, you know, that you really feel like, oh, that's what it was like to work in this theater. And I think Stephen's office is, you know, Ed Sullivan's old office. Like it's, it's pretty incredible. Oh, that's amazing. Um, what, uh, what's your favorite moment from the show? Your favorite thing that you've done? 
Um, you know, it generally is when you get someone big and you get them to just be themselves. And that's happened with a bunch of different interviews. Um, I, I think the best night I've had, uh, just from my standpoint, is when we had the Daily Show kind of reunion show. Mm -hmm. We got all back yeah. there. And that night, James Comey was fired. So we had to blow up the monologue. And then as a post tape, we had the Dave Matthews band. Like that night was probably one of these moments where you're like, I can't believe that we get to do this. Um, but most recently, I think the Howard Stern interview that Stephen did was so fantastic. And we do something, I don't know if other shows do this, but when we have someone like uh, Howard Stern or Paul McCartney, we just let him go. So there are no time cues. And I think McCartney we might have talked to him for 46 minutes. Um, wow. and, and then we will take ins and outs to break it up. And it just allows for this incredible conversation, which is, uh, I think, a place the show has really grown in the last season is with the interviews. Um, you know, I'd like to do more of that, where we really devote more time, like back the way that some of the greats did, where you could really have time to talk to somebody and not have it be broken up artificially. And then we kind of go back and have the conversation flow. Um, I'd like to do more of that. That's been the most special is when you get someone whether it's, you know, Springsteen um, or Michelle Obama or so, some of these really big interviews that they feel like they can really just relate to Stephen and we just keep the cameras rolling. I mean, we did it with Ron Burgundy. That was great. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that was a good one this week uh, or last week. Uh, what, what, what's the most underrated thing you think the show's done? I think the uh, – I don't know that the live shows get – the recognition because we don't let people behind the curtain, right? We don't show people what actually goes into it. And a lot of times, and that will never change, but a lot of times I'm just sitting there watching and going, if people knew um, what it took to get this show on the air flawlessly, both from a writing standpoint, a production standpoint and a performance standpoint, it's, um, I think people would be blown away uh, because people have gone live. You know, our competition has gone live. It's, it's not it's not rocket science to do a live show. It is rocket science, I believe, to take something that ended at 10 o'clock or 1015 and to turn all of that material around to a 14 or 15 minute monologue that entertains, you know, an hour later. And it takes it takes everybody that works on this show to operate at a very high level that I, I just don't know that anyone else could do the way we do it. Yeah. What's the craziest behind the scenes moment from the show? Uh, a couple live shows ago, uh, a half hour before the show was supposed to go on the entire video server system crashed. No. So, so we had no clips. And Stephen literally had, uh, we had to make cards for Stephen that he would read what the, if we were going to acknowledge it. And he had to read what the clip would have been and then make the <laughs> joke. And that's what we were going to have to do. And then uh, about 15 minutes uh, before we went up, the, uh, the server came back. Huh. Did Stephen keep his call? Just call. He's like, one, one thing about Stephen is if he can't change it, he doesn't freak out. Like okay. he can do freaking out is not going to make the system get up any faster. You know, people, people are freaking out on his behalf and it's like, all right, so what are we going to do if this, you know, I have to go on the air. What are we going to do? And I think Tom Purcell said, we'll just write it on card. Or Steven might've even said, just write what the clips are and I'll, I'll act them out. And that's weird. That, I don't know if we've ever told anybody that, but that's about as close as I to just absolutely passing out. <laughs> Yeah. Oh my gosh. Uh, just last question. Uh, last season during the election, uh, or the last sort of election, sort of the 2016 election cycle, Stephen brought back his old character for a few bits, which went super viral, got shared around. But it's not something you've gone and tapped back into a lot. You've been quite sparing in in that. Um, is that intentional? Will we ever see the old Stephen Colbert again? I, you know, I, I think, you know, people put, 
you know, attach like this grand thought process to that. Like <laughs> it really is. The answer is, I don't know. Uh, it, it really depends on, is there, does it feed the comedy? You know, is this specific, you know, it's, it, it, I will tell you the character would never come back as far as I am concerned to make a statement or to, to do anything other than in service of a joke. If the best way to service comedy would be to bring that character back, we'd, I'm sure Stephen would be open to doing that. It's not like we had any kind of mandate of like, don't do it again, or let's do it again. Or like none of that. It's, it's mm -hmm. really if, if it's in service of the joke. Yeah. Chris, thank you so much for talking with us. All the best with the Emmy Awards this year. Uh, and, uh, yeah, if anyone's watching this, uh, video and wants to predict the Emmys, they can go to goldderby.com and compete against the ed best editors, experts, and prognosticators on the web. Uh, thanks so much, Chris. That was great. I really appreciate it. I love uh, what you guys do. I'm a big fan.